Why don't we get started? Welcome to the Beatty Center and welcome to the uh, School of Business and Economics, the College of Charleston. I'm George Benson, president of the college. Pleased to see you here this afternoon and looking forward to your uh, wonderful talk. We are honored to have John Allison uh, with us today. He is, was the CEO of bb and Corporation for about 20 years and retired last year. He'll be more fully introduced uh, as we go along. Uh, my purpose here is simply to, to welcome you and to welcome him to the College of Charleston. Uh, he did uh, literally transform what was just an Eastern North Carolina farm bank, basically, into a powerhouse of a financial institution that came through this, this, this economic storm that we've all been feeling so seriously uh, over the last uh, year or so. Uh, it came through it extremely well. Uh, so he's been a, a role model for all of us in so many ways. So, uh, here at the college, we've also benefited from the success of BB&T. They've made wonderful contribution to the college, which is enabling us to not only have this, this speaker series and the other speakers will come in under the speaker series, but also our initiative for public choice and market process has been made possible by BB&T and, and their foundation. So John, we do thank you, uh, thank you for that as well. Uh, the, uh, interestingly, I, I met John once before. We, interestingly, used to me. Uh, we, uh, we invited John into the Terry College of Business when I was at Dean Barrow at the University of Georgia about four or five uh, years ago. And he talked to us uh, about leadership uh, on that occasion. So I think you are going to uh, thoroughly enjoy his comments today. He is a leader in the business community and has been uh, for a long time. A lot of people look up to this man. And we're, we're honored to have him uh, with us today. I also would like to recognize another great business mind that is with us. This is someone that we now call our own, and that is Alan Shaw, our new dean of the business school here. Alan, this is really the first time I've been in a public forum and been able to acknowledge you in this way, and I'm just absolutely thrilled, as is everybody else around here, that, that you've joined us. I've been in a number of meetings with, with him to date, and his ideas are new and fresh and, and innovative, and he's going to bring a whole new spirit to not only the business school here, but, but to the College of Charleston. So we're, we're just thrilled that you have joined us. And uh, by the way, we are in the midst of strategic planning process. And tomorrow, Alan presents the business school's vision for what they're going to be in the future, presented to the strategic planning committee and to the executive team. So we're all uh, waiting with bated breath. Okay. I now want to turn the microphone over to uh, Peter Falcano, who will introduce our speaker today. Peter? And Peter, by the way, is responsible for organizing this event and responsible for the contacts uh, with John Allison and all of the wonderful things that uh, have happened uh, with bb and in the College of Charleston. I wanted to publicly thank Peter for all your time. Thanks, Peter. I, like my, I want to thank President Benson for the introduction and Dean Schaub for being here today. Um, I'm pleased to welcome everybody to our final bb and Free Market Process Speaker Series for the semester. Uh, a couple of quick notes. We have some brochures and information about the initiative for public choice and market process on the back table. Uh, there's a sign-in sheet that is, uh, should be going around as well in the back, and please sign if you want. It helps us with getting sort of a count of today's event. And remind everyone that um, immediately following the talk, we're having a reception for students in the Tate Gallery which is just across the way here on the second floor. The mission of the Initiative for Public Choice and Market Process is to advance the understanding of economic, political, and moral foundations of the free society. Now, before I get into the formal introduction, I too have an anecdote for um, meeting John Allison. Uh, my colleagues and I have long been aware of the BB&T Charitable Foundation and the things that they have been doing to support economic departments throughout the Southeast and that they recognized that uh, economic departments that advanced free markets had a great benefit to society. And so our one question sort of became, how do we approach them for support? And for me at least, that question finally got answered about a year ago, April, I was on my way to a conference out on the West Coast and I was stuck in the middle seat. And I had a big plane, middle seat, don't want to be there booked my flight at the last minute. But sitting next to me, on that flight, just to my right, was John Allison. 
So knowing we had a three hour flight, and more importantly, that he had nowhere to go, right? I made my pitch to him right then and there. Um, and it was through that conversation right, that um, we now have the initiative public choice and market process. So we thank Tom for that and for uh, obviously believing in us and that short conversation. John A. Allison, chairman of the ADT Corporation, $152 billion financial holding company. Mr. Allison began his service in DBNT in 1971 as, uh, and has managed a wide variety of responsibilities throughout the bank. He became president of DBNT in 1987 and was elected chairman and CEO in July 1989. During Mr. Allison's tenure as CEO from 1989 to 2008, DBNT has grown from $4.5 billion to $152 billion in assets. In March 2009, he joined the faculty at Wake Forest University School of Business as a distinguished professor of practice. He is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he received his BS degree in business administration. He's received his master's degree in management from Duke University. He also is a graduate of the Stonier Graduate School of Banking. And he's received honorary doctorate degrees from Clemson University, East Carolina University, Mount Olive College and Marymount University. He is a member of the American Bankers Association and Financial Services Roundtable. He serves on the Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center Board of Visitors. The Board of Visitors at Quaqua School of Business at Duke University. And the Keglin Flagler, the, pardon, Keelan Flagler School of Business at UNC Chapel Hill. And he is, a, he is a member of boards of directors of the Financial Clearinghouse Independent College Fund and the Global Trans Park Foundation. Now before I actually let John come up here, I have one more remark to make. I recently received the annual report of bb and and in that report was a tribute to John Allison by their current CEO, Kelly King. And I just want to read a very small excerpt out of this for you, give you an idea of what you're in for. It says, John stood firm in his beliefs throughout his career. His fervent belief in individual rights and free markets has long been the compass for our value-driven bank. When a 2005 Supreme Court decision allowed government condemnation of property for private development, bb and declined to finance projects for private purposes on land taken from private citizens by government entities using eminent domain. This was, this was a decision driven not by profit, but principle. And more recently, John has won plaudits for many constituencies in his criticisms of the federal government's recent action which so far have not addressed the real problem of falling housing values. It is my great pleasure to present to you today, John Allison, who will speak to us on principled leadership. Thanks, Pete. It's a, a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I always like to have the opportunity to talk to bright young people who are uh, going to be future leaders in our society. Um, I know that the uh, elephant in the room is the uh, financial crisis, and I'll be glad to talk about that in the Q&A if anybody wants to cover that. But my purpose today is to really talk about leadership. And, it, and I think in a certain sense that's more fundamental in the financial crisis because I believe that failures of leadership in business, failures of leadership in government are the primary reasons that we have uh, some of our challenges in the economy. I know uh, some of the young people may not think of yourselves as leaders, but if you look at what uh, employers are looking for, for people that graduate from a college as a statute, it is people that can be in leadership roles. And also, whether you think of leading your other people, you do have a self-leadership problem and a self-leadership uh, challenge. Um, I do believe that the quality of leadership has a profound impact on the success of organizations and individuals throughout, throughout our society. Uh, what do leaders do? Well, leaders have a variety of roles, but we think they have two primary responsibilities. First, they create a sense of purpose in themselves and in their uh, organizations. And then secondly, they create the value system or support the value system that allows themselves and their organizations to be successful. As human beings, uh, we are purpose-directed entities. In fact, the organizing principle of human action is purpose. We have to know where we're going in order to get there. Uh, that is true for an individual, but it's also true for an organization. Organizations, in fact, are simply groups of individuals. That's whether that's a business or a charitable organization or a college. 
Uh, and for organizations to be successful, the individuals that are in that organization must vest in its purpose. Um, as a concrete example, BBT is very much a purpose-driven organization, and our purpose is expressed in our mission. And our mission is literally to make the world a better place to live by helping our clients achieve economic success, financial security, by creating a place where our employees can learn, grow, and be fulfilled in their work, by making the communities where we work better places to be, and thereby optimizing long-term returns for our shareholders while creating a safe and investment. We're not confused. In a free market, we work for our shareholders. Our primary fiduciary obligation is to our shareholders. However, the only means by which we can accomplish that end is by first doing a great job for our clients with all of our revenues coming from our clients. To do a great job for our clients, we've got to have great people because we're fundamentally in the people business. We've got to create the kind of environment where people want to work for BB&T, where they can learn, where they can grow. We do all that within the context of our communities, not from an altruistic perspective, but if our communities don't do well, we don't do well. We try to run our business in a very long-term perspective, do the right thing for clients, employees, and communities, and in that context, create superior rewards for shareholders. Just like an organization needs a sense of purpose, so do you. So do you. In fact, it's interesting to me how many people I encounter, and, and then they describe their work, they describe their work as some kind of burden. I have to go to work. It's kind of, it's like, it's tough. I gotta go to work. If you think about all the time, all the effort, all the energy you spend at work, if your work is just work, you're really missing a lot of what life is about. And by the way, this is not practice. This is it. This is your life. And if you can have passion and energy in life, you have to have meaning in your work through having some sense of purpose in your work. So purpose is necessary for the energy uh, that makes life worth living. It creates a passion that you want to have. Again, as a concrete example, something I asked all the employees of BB&T. Uh, are you making the world a better place to live through your work? Are you really helping your clients make better decisions that improve the quality of their lives? Have you trained yourself to do that? Are you capable of providing high quality advice? And absolutely never ever do anything that's bad for your client, even if you can make a profit in the short term, because it will always come back to haunt you. It will always come back to and the interesting thing is, if you provide really good quality advice and help your clients be more successful, they're going to be more loyal and you're going to be more successful. And the, one of the reinforcing themes I'll, I'll talk about today is life is really about creating those kind of win-win relationships. And many of you will go into leadership and management roles. You'll have people reporting to you and you'll be working within teams. You take providing meaningful feedback to people that work for you very seriously. Uh, not just filling in the performance of pay forms, but helping them learn and helping them grow. And when you do that, won't you have a more successful team and won't you be more successful in that process? And how about your peers? And this is true while you're in this college setting. Are you willing to help your peers be more successful? And won't that be a learning process for you and won't that make you more successful in the long run? And can we count on you, in our case, dealt with communities within the United Way or the March of Dimes, organizations that are successful are necessary for our success within our community. And of course, in our case, you're rewarding our shareholders. You're making good loans, you're providing good kind of financial services that reward the people that work for you. While the content will change, I would argue that everybody has the same context in terms of a sense of purpose. And it has to have two fundamental components. First, I've never met anybody that didn't want to make the world a better place to live. I believe everybody wants to make the world a better place to live. Uh, so your purpose needs to be making the world a better place to live in the context that you think is important. That doesn't mean you have to go to Africa and, and feed starving children. Businesses make the world a better place to live. We make products and services that improve the quality of life. Like a lot of the difference between the United States and, and Africa is we have better businesses. Doctors, teachers, lots, lots of ways to make the world a better place to live. But it has to be, for you to be energized, you have to feel like you're making the world a better place to live. But the second thing I would argue, and I think this gets lost a lot, in addition to make the world a, place, a better place to live, you need to do something that you want to do for you. Because you have a right to your own life. You need to do something that is meaningful and valuable to you based on your own uh, personal nature, who, who you are as an individual. Because you have just as much right to your life as anybody else. And I would argue that even if you make the world a better place to live, but you don't enjoy doing it, then you haven't been successful. Everyone needs a sense of purpose. Interesting thing, the means by which we accomplish our purpose is the principles by which we live our lives. Um, we have certainly had some serious ethical deviations in our society. We have in business. We seem to have endlessly in government. Uh, 
I think many people realize that values, ethics are important, but most people don't use very, values very effectively. And the reason for that is many people have a hodgepodge of values. They have a kind of random set of beliefs that they got at different times throughout their lives, and oftentimes those beliefs are contradictory. They do one thing, they feel guilty because they, they, didn't, they didn't do something else. And very few people have really reflected deeply on what is the purpose of values. The purpose of values is to provide us with principles that if we live these principles, we improve the probability of staying alive, being successful, and ultimately being happy. So values are really about principles that lead to success, success and happiness. Even having the right values doesn't guarantee success and happiness, because things happen in Mother Nature beyond our control, but they improve the odds. And if you think about values in that context, they're not arbitrary, they're not capricious, they don't fall out of the sky, they aren't necessarily what your mom, dad, Sunday school teachers, kindergarten teachers told you when you were five years old. In fact, defining your values is a scientific problem. And here's the question that has to be answered. Uh, what are the most likely principles to lead your, to your success and happiness given the laws of nature, mother nature, and given human nature? What principles will lead to our success given the laws of nature and human nature? We have 10 core values of BBT. As you go through these values, you'll find that they're not only non-contradictory, they're integrated. Fail on one, fail on all the others. Our first value is reality, of what is, is. A uh, baby's born here at the hospital here in Charleston this morning. That baby opens her eyes, and guess what? Mom's here, dad's here, the doctor's here, the nurse is here, we're here, the trees are here. That baby doesn't get to make it up. In fact, that baby's task in life is to figure out how to stay alive, be successful, and be happy, uh, given the facts of reality. Uh, at some point, you were that baby. You were born into this world, and you've been trying to figure out how to be successful, be happy, given the facts of reality. In one level, that is very obvious, but at another level, many people are in great resistance to reality. They just wish it wasn't so, and, and there are negative consequences from being in great resistance to reality, because it just is. It just is. People make three basic errors in regards to reality. These are actually epistemological errors, but they're, they're, they're errors in thinking, but they relate to a reality. Um, and these errors have serious negative consequences for the quality of individual lives and the quality of life on the planet. The first error, we use a metaphor, uh, wishing something is so does not make it so, is a metaphor for the ultimate psychological sin. The ultimate psychological sin is the act of evasion. Evasion occurs when you're presented with some piece of information that at some level you know needs to be found. But you refuse to examine it because it threatens something you want to believe about yourself or you want to believe about the world so you literally don't hear it. And when you obey, you're detached from reality, which is a very dangerous place to be. I grew up in my banking career as a small business lender. And I would say the primary reason that small businesses fail is because the leader of that business obeys. Things are going along fine in the business, something happens in the economy, something happens at home. They don't want to hear about it and run that business right in the ground. More recent example, Citigroup, largest financial corporation in the world, uh, hires a group of geniuses, PhD geniuses, to create their affordable housing, now subprime lending business. Uh, these were very smart people, and there may have been a legitimate market initially for some aspect of affordable housing. I will guarantee you, however, long before we knew about the problems in the affordable housing business, these really smart people knew something was going on at some level. But they evaded. Why did they evade? Because they didn't want to give up their bonuses, and they didn't want their company to less, make less money, so they ran those businesses right into the ground. Unfortunately, everybody evades. Uh, you evade. Your parents, your friends uh, have been telling you about your evasion for a long period of time. Uh, next time you hear something that you really don't want to hear, but you know you ought to think about, uh, have the courage to face it objectively and to listen to it and see if, it, see if it's right or not to make an objective. Being detached from reality is a bad place to be. The second error is, a, is the belief in popularity. Reality is independent of popularity. Uh, in, in the year uh, 1600, 99.9% .9 of the people on the planet were certain that the sun went around the earth. Got up in the morning, sun comes up the east, goes down the west. Uh, in, in the evening, sun goes around the earth. 1620, Galileo proves that the earth goes around the sun. The fact that 99.9% .9 of the people thought the sun went around the earth had no effect on the sun of the earth. Reality is independent of popularity. Um, it's interesting that a lot of people recognize that consciously, uh, but I wonder how many times have you been in a group and, and gone along with the group when you really didn't agree with what was going on. 
I saw a study not too long ago why uh, students cheat in college, and the answer is, oh, everybody cheats. It's a great rationalization uh, for cheating. My business, for an for example, I understand to some degree how a huge company like Citigroup got into the affordable housing business, but a number of banks our size got into the same industry, and they had serious financial trouble. And I talked to a number of those CEOs, some of them aren't CEOs anymore, but I talked to a number of those CEOs and asked them, you know, why did they get into that business? And they had some interesting rationalizations, but at the end of the day, you know what they said? Everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. Reality is independent of popularity. By the way, that includes politicians. Although so politicians are popular, it doesn't make them doesn't make them right. Reality is independent of popularity. The third error is the belief in authority, and this error has caused a huge amount of unnecessary human suffering. Uh, year sixteen twenty, Galileo publishes his book, proves that the Earth goes around the sun. Uh, the Pope is the intellectual, spiritual leader of Western civilization, highly educated, very intelligent man. He doesn't like Galileo's book. It threatens some of his most fundamental beliefs. So he puts Galileo under house arrest for the rest of his life. He tries to destroy every copy of Galileo's book. A few sneak out, lead to Newton, lead to the Industrial Revolution, the quality of life we have today. Guess what? Whether the Pope liked it or not, the earth kept going around the sun. Reality is independent of us all. Modern example, uh, the three great authorities in the financial services industry, Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch, they're government-sanctioned rating agencies. They misrated tons of bonds in the financial market, and people have taken huge losses because of their misrating. It's hard not to be mad at Standard Poor's, Moody's, and French. Fitch, they did a terrible job. On the other hand, on the other hand, we avoided most of that marketplace. And the reason we did is instead of just taking their, their ratings on faith, we looked at these actual instruments. And what we saw was the expected loss ratios in many of these bonds were much less than the actual experience in the early 1990s. So we decided not to, to accept their rating system. Um, you do have to rely on authorities, but you are responsible for evaluating your authorities. And just because they're authority doesn't make them right. Reality is independent of authority. One of the most uh, fundamental aspects of reality is called the law of cause and effect, or the law of causality. If you want to visualize the law of cause and effect, you can see one billiard ball hitting another billiard ball, and say the first billiard ball calls the second billiard ball uh, to move. But the law of causality is much deeper. What the law of causality says is that everything in nature has a nature, and everything must act consistent with its nature. Billiard balls have to act like billiard balls. Elephants have to act like elephants. And as a human being, we have a nature, and we absolutely have to act consistent with our nature. We have no choice. However, we're not big balls. We're not deterministic. One of the most fundamental aspects of our nature is we have free will. We have to make choices. And the, and the self-evidency of free will is in a set of choices that you've been making since you were very young and you literally make every few seconds and that only you can make. Only you can make. And that is the choice to focus your mind or not. To be here or not. Uh, when you're out of focus, you're disconnected from reality. Doing this presentation, some of you will be here, some of you won't. Nobody will be here all the time because you can't stay in focus all the time. But you do choose when you stay in focus. In a presentation like this, you ought to stay in focus. And maybe on Friday night, you might have, ought to go out of focus. But you do choose when you're in focus. You do choose when you're in focus. Um, one interesting thing that will happen, it'll happen during this presentation. I'll say something that you don't want to hear. And one way people evade is they go out of focus. They go out of focus. Um, the other unique aspect of our nature is we have the capacity to think rationally, to think object. Everything that's alive has some method of saying life. A lion has claws to hunt with, a deer has feet to avoid the hunter. We have the capacity to think. And our capacity to think is literally our only means of survival, success, and happiness. There are no shortcuts, there are no free lunch. That, uh, that's, that is our nature. We're very fortunate that the great genius of history, in my opinion, Aristotle, taught us how to think. Get that back to 300 BC. What he said is God again with sound premises based on the facts, use the induction and deduction to derive conclusions, integrate these conclusions without contradiction, the fundamental rule of logic is to avoid contradiction, and that conclusion becomes premise for a higher level of thinking. Uh, despite knowing how to think since 300 BC, a lot of times we don't think that way, we think in a very sloppy manner, and when you think in a sloppy manner, you get bad consequences because you violated your fundamental means of success and happiness. Um, it's interesting also to look at the thinking process a lot of times when we try to improve our thinking, we try to do it at a higher level. We go to 
college, we go to university, uh, graduate programs, et cetera, et cetera, which is a very, very useful exercise. We certainly support that kind of that kind of endeavor. However, the real lever in thinking is premises. If you have a problem in your premise, you will have a problem in your conclusion. If you build a 20-story building on quicksand, the building's going to fall over. In fact, it's interesting to, to think on this. The next time you get in a serious argument with somebody, I almost guarantee you the arguments around premises that neither one of you necessarily hold at a conscious level. Most disputes are differences of, around premises, fundamental beliefs. And it's interesting to think about where you've got the most important beliefs in your life, your most fundamental premises. you got your most important fundamental premises from your mom, dad, Sunday school ten, teachers, kindergarten teachers when you were very young. Where did they get their fundamental beliefs from? Their mom, dad, Sunday school ten, teachers, kindergarten teachers when they were very young. Where did they get their beliefs from? Their mom, dad, Sunday school teachers, kindergarten teachers when they were very, very young. If you think about that process, first, your beliefs are very primitive. And second, the odds are very high that you got a hodgepodge of beliefs. Some that make sense and some that don't. You can probably see things in your parents, even though you love your parents, that keep them from being as successful, more important, keep them from being as happy as they could be. You may have a different content, the odds are very high that you have the same content. If you want to improve your thinking process, the most powerful thing you can do by far is to objectively look at your fundamental beliefs as an adult and reject all beliefs which, which are inconsistent with reality, they can't be, and reject all contradictions. Contradictions can exist in reality. Induction and deduction. Deduction is where we go from the general to the specific. All men are moral. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is moral. Uh, deduction is a concrete application of a general principle. It's a very powerful thinking tool. The portion of the Aristotle pretty much outlined the rules for deduction. And I find in groups like this, most people just do this pretty well. You don't typically see deduction errors except, except when people see an argument, they know what the conclusion ought to be, but they evade because they don't want to know what the conclusion is, which is more of a psychological problem than a thinking uh, problem. As useful as deduction is, far, far more important is induction. Induction is where you go from the concrete things in the, in, the, in the real world to a general principle. How did you decide that all men were born? Where did that come from? Uh, the most basic expression of induction is concept formation. Concept formation is a natural human attribute. Basically, all humans can do it. Some can do it better than others. Uh, when you were one or two years old, you were able to look at chairs, and see they were like each thing and different, each other and different than other things. You developed a word of concept called chair. And your parents got real excited because they realized that was the beginning of the thinking process. And when you have children, you get excited too because that's the beginning of the thinking process. And then you were able to look at tables and see they were like each other and different other things. You developed a word of concept called table. And then you made a giant intellectual leap. You look at tables and chairs that don't look like each other at all. You grasp that they have a common purpose and you develop a word of concept called furniture. And you did that all the way up your hierarchy of thinking, up to the most advanced concepts. What's truth? What's justice? What is love? Well, how should the world be one? Who should you vote for president? Very complex ideas built in that same kind of process. A couple of thoughts about concept formation. Concept formation is what makes the human mind so powerful. Take something as simple as chairs. In the real world, there are literally billions of chairs. If you had to deal with them perceptually like an animal, all you could do is think about chairs. Well, they, they wouldn't be there. That's all you could think about. In one word, you've literally captured billions of concrete things in the real world. So the efficiency of your thinking process depends on how good a job you do developing your concepts. Second thought about concepts, and this really deals with two big uh, psychological, uh, two, two big philosophical issues. One thing that is certainly true is that you need to keep an open mind. But people often use that as an argument to say that you need to be skeptical, you can't be certain about anything. That's not so. Take something as simple as a chair. You know a lot more about chairs now than you did when you were two years old. Uh, and you've learned a lot more about chairs. And you'll learn more throughout the rest of your life. However, just because you know more now than when you were two years old doesn't mean what you knew was wrong. Every concept should be open-ended. You always have the opportunity to learn more. You should never close off a concept. But that doesn't mean you can be un need to be uncertain or skeptical. You can know many things with certainty and still learn more about them. Third thing about concepts, they are high art. You started with tables and chairs, you went to furniture, and then you went on and doing very advanced concepts, love, truth, justice. Interesting thing, uh, I'll give you the good news and the bad news. The good news is the odds are very high that you did a great job on tables and chairs. The bad news is on the advanced concepts, truth, justice, how the world ought to be run, the odds are very high, almost certain that you cheated. 
And the reason you cheated is you got those concepts from authorities. And where did they get their concepts? From authorities. Where did they get their concepts from authorities? Your most advanced ideas ought to be traceable back to reality, or they're not true. They're not true. Why well, I talk about concept formation with a business group. Um, in business, we talk about something called learning from experience. And the purpose of learning from experience, I think, is that you need to become a, uh, a, a real master of your field of endeavor. And I think that's always been true, but it's a lot more true today. Uh, if you f face the fact that you're competing with 7 billion people on this planet, they're better educated than they used to be, or much closer to us than they used to be through technology, you're willing to work a lot harder than you for a lot less, you're in a very interesting world. You better be a master of your field of endeavor. And to become a master of the field of endeavor, what you, in interestingly enough, have to do is develop concepts that help you make better decisions. Probably all of you have had really good teachers and not so good teachers. And what, one of the different aspects of the really good teachers, they have concepts and means to communicate that to you in a way that you can understand what's going on. Bad teachers don't. Probably have good doctors and not so good doctors. You go into a really good doctor, they'll move very quickly from your symptoms to the to the issues that you have. We have really good lenders and not so good lenders in our business. They develop con the good lenders to develop concepts that enable them to make better decisions. In, in that process. So you need to be a master of your field of endeavor in the kind of world that we're in. And interestingly enough, that requires in a very broad context that you be a very active learner. Because remember all those concepts rose in. And to be a very active uh, learner, you need to have a very active mind. A very active mind. And this is a lot more important, in my opinion, than whether you're a genius or what your IQs are. If you have a very active mind and are committed to the learning process, you can become a master. If you look at people that are committed to learning, they tend to read more, they go to more educational seminars, but they're particularly effective at learning from their experiences. And as human beings, we are primarily experiential learners. And if you look at people that are superior experiential learners, that have become masters of their field of endeavor, they do two simple but profound things with them. First, probably everybody here can associate with learning from your mistakes. Probably some big lessons in life came from mistakes. However, unfortunately, a lot of times we don't learn from our mistakes. We get to do them over and over and over again. Probably have embedded in your personality some mistakes, some things you did, and you said, Ooh, I've done that before, and I wish I hadn't done it before, and, and then you do it again, do it again. Uh, and the reason that we don't learn from our mistakes, in order to learn from a mistake, we have to have the willingness to admit not only that we made a mistake, but the deepest cause of that mistake. And unfortunately, a lot of times we evade, so we don't learn from our mistakes. We get to do it again and again. Superior experiential learners learn far more rapidly from their mistakes. Initially, they may make more mistakes, but they learn faster from their mistake making process because they evade less. The thing, second thing that superior experiential learners do is recognize that life is a constant education if you choose to make it one. If you choose to make it one. Now, I, over the years, I've, I've visited our community banks. We have 33 community banks, and as part of that process, I have a luncheon with our highest performing officers and our local advisory board members who are business and community leaders. And that has always been an educational process for me. It's very obvious that those type of leaders have very active minds. They're asking lots of questions. I'm getting feedback. It's a great learning process for me, and I think it's a great learning process for them because they are in focus. They're paying attention to what's going on. Sometimes you go eat lunch with some people and it's a very boring conversation because they aren't really interested in what's going on and it's not and you're not interested in that process. So peer experiential learners recognize that life is a constant education if you choose to make it and change the state of focus. Some business leaders have high IQs, but I don't think that's necessarily what distinguishes business leaders. My experience is it's the best people in business uh, refuse to evade and they stay in focus more. And that is a huge competitive advantage in life. Because a lot of people evade a lot and a lot of people uh, don't stay uh, don't stay in focus. A third thing is independent thinking. Independent thinking means thinking for yourself and the facts of reality. It's important because it makes two things both possible and necessary, responsibility and creativity. Um, the most important meta-psychological decision you can choose to make is to be responsible for yourself. If you view yourself as a victim, then somebody else has to change to make your life better. And you can't change anybody else. Uh, you cannot change anybody else. A lot of people view themselves as victims for a multitude of reasons because of my race, my sex, my nationality. 
most common reason that people view themselves as victims is because they're mothers. If I had a different mother, I'd be a, a very happy person. A uh, very happy person. Um, interesting to think about, something that everybody knows and most people don't want to admit, is that at least at the level of consciousness, we are all alone. Sorry. At least at the level of consciousness, we are all alone. Therefore, only you can be responsible for you. It is not possible for anybody else to be responsible for you. Nobody else can be responsible for you. The flip of that's also true. You cannot be responsible for anybody else. Classic parental error, classic managerial error. You cannot be responsible for your children. If you try to be responsible for your children, you will set your children up to fail. You are responsible to do your absolute best to teach their, your children to be responsible for themselves. But you cannot be responsible for your children. You cannot be responsible for your employees. I see this a lot, particularly in, in young managers. They try to be responsible for their employees, and they set the employee and themselves up to fail. You are responsible to do your absolute best to help your employees be successful. However, if you find somebody that won't become responsible for themselves after a reasonable amount of effort, get a different employee. Get a different employee. It is um, true that bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. Mother Nature just is. But you're responsible for doing the best you can with what, for what happens to you. I find an interesting thing um, in groups like this, highly successful groups. By the way, you wouldn't be here if you weren't highly successful. The definition of you wouldn't be in this room. Highly successful people are, by definition, responsible for their success. But I find very often highly successful people don't take responsibility for their own personal happiness. And only you can let you have Creativity, all human progress by definition is based on creativity. And unless somebody does something better, which will be different, there cannot be any progress. Creativity is only possible to an independent thinker. Somebody that thinks like the crowd cannot be innovative, cannot be creative, cannot contribute to human progress. That's why entrepreneurs are so important. It's fundamentally why free markets work, because it allows, it provides an environment for creativity, uh, creative change. Interesting to look at creativity. Uh, if you ask people about creativity, many people view creativity as some kind of magical act activity. And since you can't do magic, you can't be creative, right? Creativity is not a magical activity. It's an intellectual exercise. It is a form of thinking. It is true that most creativity takes place in the subconscious, but 95% of your thinking takes place in the subconscious. A reasonable analogy is to think of yourself as a, as a computer programmer and you put the programs down into your subconscious. No programs run. You wrote the programs and, 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 uh, and you own the programs, but a lot of the times you don't know what's going on in that program. And, and creativity is of that nature, but it is an intellectual activity. If you look at people that are creative, it's interesting what distinguishes them. Not, not IQs or things like that. It's two things. First, they believe they're capable of being creative and they believe they should be. Fourth value is productivity. Um, productivity exists in two planes. At the macro level, in a free market, profit is a good thing. It's simply the difference between the value of what we create and the cost of creating. The bigger the difference, the better. better. To be highly profitable, an organization must be very efficient. It must be very productive. At the individual level, productivity is a gut level commitment to get the job done. I think there's a fundamental psychological difference between high performers and non-performers. Non-performers look for reasons to fail. High performers have that gut level commitment to get the job done. Over the years, I've had many opportunities to visit our branches and visit our home office functions. And I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll go to one of our branches where things aren't going too well, and the branch manager will always have a story. And the story will be, you know, those competitors are charging too low rates on loans, they're paying too high rates on deposits. You know, they can't get in here because we've got the, the, the stoplight. And those people in the home office, they just fix the computer, everything will be okay. Sometimes there's some truth in that. Sometimes there are obstacles that people cannot overcome. That sometimes you can't, you can't do the impossible. On the other hand, sometimes we get a new branch manager and everything's okay. I contract that, <laughs> contrast that with our, uh, what we call our Sterling Award winners, our highest producing employees. Interesting thing about Sterling Award winners, we have four or five thousand people that could be Sterling Award winners, a very, very few people win the award every year. And yet the same 25% tend to win over long periods of time. Win one year, don't win the next year, come back, win the next year. Same 25% tend to win. And if you talk to Sterling Award winners, these highly productive people, um, they face lots of obstacles, but they don't tell you about the obstacles. 
They tell you about that. I'm going to reach this goal, and I'm going to do more next year. We're going to tell you how much more they're going to do next year. So they face the same obstacles, but they have a very different psychological commitment. Non-performers tend to look for the reasons to fail. High performers are committed to success. They don't always succeed, but they always come back and they always have that gut level commitment to get the job done. Our fifth value is honesty, and honesty is a foundational value. Without it, nothing else works. Uh, if there's no honesty, there cannot be no trustworthiness, there can be no meaningful relationship. So honesty is a foundational value. If you think about many of the ethical deviations in our society are related to honesty. So honesty is a very fundamental value. It's important to think about the standard of honesty because a lot of times when people talk about honesty, it's, it's, if you're wrong, you're viewed as being dishonest. The interesting thing is you can be wrong and be honest because as human beings, we're not, we're not omniscient. But there is a very rigorous standard for honesty. We must mean what we say and know what we mean. We must mean what we say and know what we mean. Mean what we say means you don't obviously mislead people. Now, I would say this, in, in groups like this, there's probably nobody in here that does that very much. You tend to get selected out. You don't make it if you do that very much. If you do, you will get caught and you'll be selected out at some point in time. But the standard is rigorous in that, unfortunately, many times people do tell white lies and the cumulative effect of white lies is a black lie. You see that in management very often where somebody will tell you about one of their, uh, one, a person working for you, they'll tell you some challenges that person has. And then when they give feedback to that employee, they don't, they sugarcoat it. They don't tell that employee really what they really think. And then they get mad at the employee because the employee didn't hear what they didn't say. Uh, you probably see that in spousal relationships. People don't tell each other the truth. You see it in your friendships uh, and, and uh, where you kind of don't quite tell the truth. And the cumulative effect of white lies, often said, quote, with good intentions, is a black lie. Um, Honesty demands that we say what we mean. And it's very important because it improves the feedback process. Sometimes you're just wrong. <laughs> and, you can, and if you don't say what you mean, you can't learn in that process. Know what we mean. Uh, the standard's not omniscient, because human beings are not omniscient. But there is a very uh, rigorous standard in this sense. You can't claim a level of knowledge you don't have. Probably, maybe sometimes you get people getting arguments and they start claiming more knowledge than they, they have. That is a form of dishonesty. Uh, so you have to claim the knowledge that you actually have. And one of the clear reflections of honesty is we keep our agreements. Honesty requires. Our sixth value is integrity. Um, there are a lot of apparent temptations in life. In the banking business, we have lots of the temptations of the world. What's your thing that you can know? If you develop your principles logically based on the facts, those temptations aren't temptations. They're just ways to fail. They're just ways to Integrity is really simply the, the harmony of mind and body, doing what you believe you say you should do. Doing what you believe you should do. Interesting lot, a lot of people don't have integrity. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. First, they don't have values. And if you don't have values, you can't act consistent with your values. Or secondly, they have values that don't make any sense or not are not integrated. So they can't act consistent with their whole value system. You can disagree with what I say here, but I would argue in order to have integrity, if you think that's important. You need to be clear about your values and they have to be integrated or you literally, by definition, can't have integrity. A lot of people view integrity as some kind of duty. Well, I have to act with integrity. Not so. Integrity is a means to success and happiness. If you've developed your values logically, your principles logically based on the facts, you want to live by those principles so they lead to success and happiness. But what integrity does demand, and this is what scares me in our society today, the integrity demands a long-term perspective. Because there are many things that are, quote, better in the short term that will come to haunt you in the long term. And if you look at people who get in trouble, they're doing often things that, quote, are good in the short term that go to harm them in the long term. So what integrity demands is self-discipline, not as a duty, but as a means to your long-term success and happiness. You can see government policies lack integrity. A lot of times they're doing things that sound good in the short term that almost certainly are going to have long-term negative. Uh, never compromise your principles, and that is in order to enable you to become more successful and happier in the long run. Justice. In individual relationships, uh, justice is the number one value. If you ask somebody what I think about my manager, they're pretty soon going to say, well, I think my manager is just, fair, or not. People don't want to work for somebody that under-rewards them. Interesting enough, over-rewards performance and the right to feel that way. In addition, if there's no reward for superior performance, 
the best people will leave and we'll be worse off. Uh, equally important, there's no reward for superior performance. The average person will not be motivated to do better. And a lot of leadership and management is to get, about, is to get average people to perform at above average levels. At BBT, we strongly believe that those that contribute the most should receive the most. Our goal is to ensure that rewards go with performance. Managing performance is a difficult task. We are wrong sometimes, but the goal is clear. We want to be sure those that contribute the most receive the most. Because we believe in justice, we consciously reject egalitarianism. In fact, I would argue that egalitarianism is maybe the most destructive idea in our society today. What egalitarians want is not equal opportunity. They want equal outcome. Uh, it is true that everybody uh, should be equal for law. It's true that every human being ought to be treated with dignity and respect because they're human beings. It is not true that everybody's equal. In fact, I have never met two people. Every person in this room is unique, is different. Everybody in this room is a unique, special individual. We're all special, unique individuals. Uh, at the extreme, Thomas Edison and <coughs> the Boston Strangler are not equal. They are not equal. Because people are not equal, we do have to judge people. You have to judge a lot of things. Are you wearing the right clothes? You, uh, did you buy the right car? Are you eating the right food? Are the right people working for you? Are you working for the right people? Do you have the right kind of friends? Are you marrying the right person? Do your children have the right kind of friends? In fact, I would argue in management and leadership, probably the most important thing you have to do is to judge, to evaluate other people. Uh, and, and so that's a very important part of your life. So you do have to judge. You do have to evaluate other people. Because people, people are different. They're not equal. Uh, because it's important, it's important how you do it. It's a proper method for judging and evaluating other people. You have to judge people as individuals, based on their merits, based on what matters in that circumstance. So you do have to judge, you do have to evaluate people. But as individuals, based on their merits, based on what matters in that circumstance. For that reason, we consciously reject collectivism and all its ugly variations. Collectivists evaluate people by their membership in a group, by definition, collectivists are always wrong, as people in the group are always different. Forms of collectivism include racism, sexism, communism, socialism, nationalism, all forms of collectivism. In business, the most common forms of collectivism you see is racism and sexism. Uh, we made some progress on racism and sexism, but we still have some racists and sexists. And if you look at the motivation for a racist or sexist, I really believe it's primarily low self-esteem. Because it's, you know, I'm not too good, but my group's better than your group kind of mentality. But what racists and sexists fail to realize, and this goes to a general principle, is that being a racist or sexist is bad for them. I'll give you a concrete example. We have a, a, a branch manager, and that branch manager uh, doesn't hire the right person to do the job because that person's male, female, uh, black, white, Chinese, any other non-essential race. What's going to happen? That branch is going to be less successful than it would have been if she'd hired the right person. If she continues that pattern, she'll eventually get fired because that branch will be unsuccessful. But being a racist or sexist is bad for the person being discriminated against, but it's also bad for the person doing the discrimination. But that leads to a very general principle. <coughs> our means of survival, success, and happiness is our capacity to think rationally. One of the most important arenas in which we need to think rationally is our evaluation of other people. When we evaluate other people for the wrong reasons, bad things happen to us. And by the way, that transcends racism and sexism. If you evaluate people because of their hair color or their weight. Uh, if you choose your spouse because of how good they look versus how good a character they have, bad things end up happening to you. So you do have to judge other people, but you have to judge them on rational standards. A um, couple other thoughts about justice. Um, justice is a two-edged sword. Uh, justice requires that we reward superior performance, but it also requires that we deal with non and I find that difficult for a lot of young uh, managers and leaders that go out in the workforce. They don't want to deal with non-performance. Failing to deal with non-performance is a form of injustice. It's a form of injustice in two ways. First, non-performance hurts the team, so it's unfair to the team. But secondly, it's unfair to the non-performance. I have never met a happy non-performer. Plus, they can't learn, they can't grow. If, if, a, if a, like this, if a professor gives you a grade you haven't learned, earned, it's really a bad message for you in terms of your learning process. Failing to deal with non-performance is destructive to non-performance. It's a form of injustice. One last thought about justice. Justice only applies to human action. Mother Nature is neither just nor unjust. Mother Nature just is. And a lot of people spend a lot of energy cursing Mother Nature. Mother Nature just is. 
got this own fight. Our eighth value is pride. Aristotle said that pride was the greatest of all virtues because to have it, you had to have all the others. You had to be just, honest, have integrity, be a rational, independent thing. As such, uh, pride serves two very important roles. It's a psychological reminder to do good and a psychological reward for having done good. I want to give you a, an interesting question to ask yourself. I think this is a very important question, and, and it probably needs to be asked more often than you think. And that is the next time you face an ethical decision, which is fairly often, the next time you ask, face an ethical decision, ask yourself this question. Would you tell the people you care about, not the newspapers, but the people you care about, what you're going to do and why you're going to do it? If you wouldn't tell the people you care about what you're going to do and why you're going to do it, don't do it. Because you will always know what you did, and you will always know why you did it. And you always want to be able to be proud of it. Our ninth value is self-esteem and self-motivation. For people in this room, this is, in my opinion, the highest value, the one that has the biggest impact. I, I see at high levels in organizations when people fail. It's almost never because they uh, aren't smart enough, and it's almost never because they don't have a good enough educational background. It's almost always some self-esteem reason, some subconscious belief that causes them to act in self-destructive behavior. Self-esteem is a huge issue. Self-esteem is also the foundation for happiness. And happiness is the end of the game. And I use happiness in the broadest, long-term uh, context of the word, not temporary happiness, real, meaningful uh, happiness. It's, you know, money may be nice, but money's only important if it's a means to happiness. Happiness is the end of the game. And to, have, to be a happy person, you have to have a reasonably high level of self-esteem. Um, so self-esteem is extremely important, and yet it's almost totally misunderstood. In fact, most people got it back. I'm going to share with you several thoughts on self-esteem. First of all, self-esteem is fundamentally self-confident in your ability to live and be successful given the facts of reality. So you earn self-esteem by how you live your life. Nobody can give you self-esteem. You can't give anybody self-esteem. If you promote a, a child that had a master's degree, you end up in the long term lowering your self-esteem. You can't give your children self-esteem. You can't give anybody self-esteem. Self-esteem is earned. Live your life with integrity. Raise your self-esteem. Second thought about self-esteem, and this is, I think, the most important thought, in some ways, I know the most controversial thought that I have today. In order to have a high level of self-esteem, you must believe, at a very deep level, that you're capable of being good, and that you have the moral right to be happy. In order to have a high level of self-esteem, you must believe, at a very deep level, that you're capable of being good, and you have a moral right to be happy. Unfortunately, a very common belief in our society is that, as human beings, we're born bad. And I suspect everybody in here has a little bit of that belief. And the reason that we're born bad is we're selfish. And selfish is bad, right? Uh, Johnny in the sandbox, four years old, having a good time playing with his truck, not bothering along anybody. Uh, along comes Fred. Fred would like to have Johnny's truck. Johnny doesn't want to give him a truck. Uh, argument ensues, right? Nice, nice argument ensues. Mom, dad, son, school teacher, kindergarten teacher interferes in the argument. He says, hey, Johnny, don't, uh, uh, don't be selfish. Give that truck to to Fred, don't be selfish, don't be bad. Now, the interesting question is where did Fred get the right to Johnny's truck? You know, we have a social welfare system. There he is, right there. In the box. It. How about Johnny? Johnny hears that, don't be selfish, don't be bad, whatever, a thousand times, between two and ten, or if, you have, if, if it's a female, gets to hear it ten times as many times, don't be selfish, don't be bad. People begin to believe they're bad because they're selfish, right? Um, interesting question. Immutable, non-negotiable fact of reality. Everything that is alive must act in its self-interest or die. Immutable, non-negotiable fact of reality. Everything that is alive must act in its self-interest or die. Lion has to hunt or starve. A deer has to run from the hunter or be eaten. A tree shade out other trees to get sunlight. Amoeba take chemical that other amoeba would like to have. Life by definition is self-sustaining action. Anything that's alive that quits sustaining its life dies. That's the way Mother Nature designed the system. To say that man is bad because he's selfish is just to say you're bad because you're alive. You have to act in your self-interest or die. That's how Mother Nature designed the system. Now it's very important that we define they slept on rocks. They were really good authors. Not exactly how you want to live your life, right? 
taking advantage of other people uh, doesn't work. Self-sacrifice doesn't work. What we really are in life is we're treasures. We trade value for value. We get better together. In our business, we help our clients achieve economic success. They let us make a profit doing it. We get better together. In fact, life is really about creating win-win relationships. There are only two stable relationship conditions, win-win and lose-lose. Whenever you get greedy and you try to create a win-lose relationship, I guarantee you the other person will get bitter and end up being a win be a lose lose relationship. You see that spousal relationship. Start out win win, one party gets killed, greedy, ends up lose lose. Interesting enough, the flip is true. If you're in a relationship that's lose win, you might be okay for a while, but pretty soon you're going to get bitter and you're going to tank that relationship. So the things they don't do there, God will. Probably in the college, you get put in groups of four or five people, and one person doesn't do their job, and that's a very frustrating experience. Uh, that's a poor team player by definition. Secondly, the good team players should they root for their fellow teammates to be successful. There's an old saying in the South, uh, uh, lie down when dogs get fleas. The flip of that's true. Spend time with great people, get to be great. Uh, what you really, whenever uh, you talk about rational decision making, people say, well, what about emotions? Are you saying emotions aren't important? Da, 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 da. Emotions are very important. They're not going away. Uh, it's part of who we are as human beings. Emotions are very important. However, most people misunderstand the role of emotions. In a certain way, emotions are like primitive values. They're automatic responses that we develop largely as children to people, events, and things in our, in our lives that enable us to make, make decisions. You make, meet somebody you like, and then you meet somebody you like them, and you like them, so I'm gonna like that kind of person. You go to some kind of event you don't like, you go to another event like it, and you don't like it, and say, I'm not gonna like that kind of event, and you develop these automated responses, which is actually very helpful. You do it, in, uh, in, it largely as a child, but, it, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel. People in, in a room like this, I would suspect that your emotions, generically speaking, are helpful to you. Most of the time, they're probably pretty decent guys to action. You wouldn't want to be driven by the emotions of somebody in prison. Their emotional guys would be very destructive. However, I've never met anybody that didn't have some dysfunctional emotions. Some emotions that didn't make sense. Some emotions that took them couple of thoughts about emotions. Emotions are learned. A lot of people view emotions as magical, mystical. They're not. They're learned. If they weren't learned, we'd all have the same emotions. And I would say everybody in here would have has different emotional responses. We probably have a propensity towards certain emotions, but we learn our emotions. Because our emotions are learned, you can change your emotions. It's very hard to change your emotions. It takes lots of